15 minute video lesson is to help undergraduates to improve their skills in the clinical examination of the cardiovascular system. Here I focus on the technique and not on individual physical science or their interpretation. Cardiovascular examination is divided into several components. We start by doing a relevant general examination, then we proceed on to the examination of the pulse, blood pressure, the neck and lastly the precordium. Precordial examination is also in two parts, palpation and then auscultation. This is Sarath who has kindly volunteered to help us today. Thank you very much for coming today Sarath. We approach the patient from the right side and the preferred position for the examination is at 45 degrees. As you approach the patient, you take a wide angle look. See whether the patient is comfortable, whether the patient is breathless, whether there is pallor or cyanosis. Then you get close to the patient, you start by examining the head and the neck. Look at the conjunctivi for pallor. Look around the eyelid for xanthelasma. Sarat Divadan. Look at the tongue for central cyanosis. Katahundararin. And inside the mouth for septic teeth. Cut. Look at the precordium. Look for left thoracotomy scar. Look for any sternotomy scars. And look for any bulging of the precordium. Then you pick up the hands. There are a lot of information one can get from inspection of the hands. Look for any nicotine stains, vasculitic lesions, splinter hemorrhages, and then look for clubbing. When you look for clubbing, you should hold the finger at your eye level. You compare with your own finger and compare the angle. The earliest sign of clubbing is loss of this angle. There are several degrees of clubbing. The earlier stage of clubbing is loss of the angle. In later stages, there will be increased curvature and in very late stages, the whole distal phalanx will be like a drumstick. Now in infective endocarditis, clubbing is usually mild. If there is a gross clubbing and cyanosis, that indicates the presence of congenital cyanotic heart disease. Then focus your attention on the feet and look for neancal edema. Okay. Apply firm pressure just above the medial malleolus and hold it there for a few seconds. Then take your finger out and see whether there is pitting. If the patient has been in bed for some time, it is possible that there is no edema at the ankle, but all the edema fluid is collected over the sacrum. In that case, you will have to ask the patient to sit up and then look for pitting edema over the sacrum. You start examination of the pulse by first palpating the radial artery. First you count the pulse and then check whether the pulse is regular or not. Then pay attention to the character. I would like to refer you to Hutchison's clinical methods to learn about different characters of the pulse. Also check whether the pulse volume is normal, low volume or high volume. If the pulse volume is high and if the pulse is bounding, you have to look for a collapsing pulse. Before you check for the collapsing pulse, you ask the patient whether there is any problem with the shoulder joint. Hold the ball of your left palm on the radial pulse 
and then lift it high in air. Support the arm with the right hand. If there is collapse impulse, you will feel that bound impulse both with your left hand and with your right hand. Sometimes the character of the pulse is better appreciated on the brachial pulse or over the carotid. Then you end the examination of the pulses by checking all the other pulses, both carotids, Sarat may petal ball, no? other radial pulse and pedal pulses. Miss okay, Galavano. Those are the speedies. And then posterior tibia. If the patient is hypertensive, you have to look for the radiofemoral delay. In the examination of the neck, you concentrate on the pulsations. If there are any pulsations, you have to find out whether they are arterial or venous. Venous pulsations are in the posterior triangle, they have a definite upper margin, they have a sinuous waveform that moves with respiration and venous pulses can be easily obliterated by applying light pressure. Once you find the JVP or the jugular venous pressure, you have to get the upper level. You do it by measuring the vertical height. First you draw a horizontal like this and then measure the vertical height from the angle of Louis. In addition to getting the height of the jugular venous pressure, you have to see whether there are any abnormal waveforms. Again, I would like to refer you to Hutchison's clinical methods to learn about abnormal venous pulsations. Prominent arterial pulsations are called Corrigan's sign and that is a sign of several cardiac problems including aortic regurgitation and hyperdynamic circulation. Measurement of the blood pressure is an integral part of the cardiovascular examination. There are a few important points I want to stress. When you apply the cuff, it should be over the brachial artery. There should be at least one inch gap above the cubital fossa. And when you wrap it up, make sure that there are no wrinkles. There is a separate video on measurement of the blood pressure. And I would like to refer you to that video. Let's move on to the precordial examination. We start the precordial examination by looking for the apical pulse. Sometimes the apical pulsation may be visible. Look for any parasternal pulsations and the pulsations in the second intercostal space. Pulsations, the second intercostal space indicate the presence of pulmonary hypertension. Try and locate the apex by palpation. First, by using the whole hand and then by trying to locate it. It is very important that you localize the apex. You localize the apex by counting the rib spaces. The second space starts at the angle of Louis and then you start counting downwards and laterally. Second, third, fourth and fifth intercostal space. And also you localize the lateral location of the apex by drawing the mid clavicular line. Mid clavicular line is a line drawn 
from the midpoint between the acromion and the suprasternal notch. You describe the apex in relation to the rib space as well as to the mid clavicular line. Once you locate the apex, it is important to describe the character as well. The character could be normal apex, tapping apex in case of mitral stenosis, or whether it is heaving. And the heaving could be a sustained heave indicating pressure overload or non sustained thrusting apex indicating the volume overload. Examination of the character of the apex gives you a lot of valuable information. Left parasternal heave is a sign of right ventricular hypertrophy. There are several ways of checking for the parasternal heave. One is to keep the fingers in the intercostal spaces like this and the other way is to keep the ulnar border of the hand firmly against the left sternal border. In case of severe pulmonary hypertension, one might even feel the closure of the pulmonary valve in the second intercostal space. This coincides with a loud pulmonary second sound. The last component of the cardiovascular examination is auscultation. You start auscultating by using the bell and auscultating over the mitral area or the apex. Then you ask the patient to turn to the left lateral side and auscultate over the same area. Then you use the diaphragm and again auscultate over the apex and along the left sternal edge, tricuspid area, second intercostal space on the left side, pulmonary area and on the right the aortic area. You have to auscultate the whole precordium as well. When you auscultate, first you concentrate on the heart sounds, first and second sounds and ask yourself whether they are normal or abnormal. Are they of normal intensity, are they louder than normal or are they softer than normal? Then you concentrate on the additional sounds, third, fourth heart sounds and any clicks. Then if there are any murmurs, you concentrate on the murmurs and try and ask yourself whether the murmur is systolic murmur or a diastolic murmur. It is very important that you time the murmur. To time the murmur, you should have your thumb over the carotid while auscultating. First you concentrate on the systole and diastole and see whether the murmur you hear is a systolic murmur or a diastolic murmur. If it is a systolic murmur, ask yourself whether it is a pan-systolic murmur or an ejection systolic murmur. In case of diastolic murmurs, you should find out whether they are early diastolic murmur or mid diastolic murmur. If you hear a murmur, for example, if you hear a murmur in the mitral area, you should check whether it radiates to the axilla. If you hear any murmurs in the base of the heart, that is the upper part of the sternal edge, you should see whether they radiate into the carotid. You complete the auscultation over the base of the heart by listening in the seated position. Sarat Puddak Vadi Vinna Under Usma Karagani Eliyata Dala Allagan Usma Keliyata Dhan Ohum Allagan Navattagani in this position, during expiration, you listen for the early diastolic murmur of the aortic regurgitation. Lastly, with the bell of the stethoscope, you listen over the carotid for a breathe. At the end of the clinical examination of the cardiovascular system, 
you should be ready with answers to few questions. First question is, is there a cardiac lesion and if so, what is the lesion? Then, whether the patient is in sinus rhythm or not. And thirdly, whether there is any evidence of heart failure. To find the answer to the last question, you have to listen to the lung bases and also examine for the tender enlargement of the liver.